You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and I have Ron Barshop. He's the CEO of Beacon Clinics. So, Ron, thank you for coming. How are you doing? Hey, Rich, I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. Well, tell me, what's the premise of uh, Beacon Clinic? We concluded about 2012 that there's a giant gap in allergy ancillary service for primary care physicians. So, PCPs are in trouble right now. They are starving for income and starving for rep relevance as they're getting bought up in sort of legendary fashion the last seven, eight years. So this is a way for the independent to stay independent by taking home some meaningful income while, while performing some meaningful outcomes in a giant field called allergy. So pretty much everybody, you live in Texas, everybody in Texas is walking in with sniffles and seizures into these docs' offices. Over half of them are presenting with allergy, don't even know they have the disease. And so we just eliminate the disease with uh, tried and true strategies that are uh, in the industry. So you're calling allergies a disease? I figured it was like just a temporary uh, acute response to uh, your native plants and things. That's in the officially area. it's officially a disease with an official cure. Actually, you can eliminate allergy if you give the right medications and the right doses. Um, you can move to another part of the country. We'll go visit our son-in-law in Atlanta, and I'll get sick all over again. But in Texas, I'm fine. Now, Texas is so big; we have three bio regions. So if I go to see you in Austin from Houston, I might get sick all over again. You go north to Dallas a little bit, and you might get sick all over again because there's three different types of pollens up there and weeds and grasses that can get you sick. So you might be cured in Houston in this region, but you might get sick all over again when you go visit other parts of the country. So it's not, when I say it's a cure, I can, I mean, as a child, I would be terrified when I heard grass being cut in the neighborhood. I don't know if you're of the generation when you play kick the ball and kick the bucket and oh, yeah. you have the flag when you're looking in the front yard. Well, when I heard a lawnmower coming, yeah. I would go inside because. Flu season for me, baby. I would be sick as a dog when I heard or smelled any grass. Now, mm. you can put a nice, fresh pet lawnmower up against my nose and I'll sniff it like cocaine. So what's a, well, for people that don't know, what's the mechanism of allergic response? And then we'll talk about, you know, treatments, et cetera. So the, uh, the body does not recognize with the immune system. There's several immune systems, but the immune system that deals with allergy does not recognize allergens is not being a parasite, not being a virus, not being a bacteria, not being a fungi. So these are invaders that come to the body. Your immunoglobulin response is going to be white blood cells attacking these things and doing away with them, eating them essentially. And when, a, when an allergen comes in or a dander comes in or a dust mite residue comes in, it doesn't know what to do with it. So for 60 million people, it has this cascade effect that basically starts trying to wash it out of your body. So you get sniffles and itchiness and you get sneezing, uh, watery eyes, and your body is just trying to do everything by throwing these little sticky bullets out it called cytokines and trying to rid it of the body. But it's not doing it any good, so it just keeps sending more and more cytokines, and it just creates more of a, from a drip effect on Niagara Falls in your body. And it's trying to right. flush it out. So, so itching, scratching, all of those uh, symptoms of allergy are the immune system a little bit confused what to do with this invader which most people, five out of six people, it just recognizes it's no big deal. But uh, people have allergies. And if food allergy is even worse, it's a different immune system in the stomach, and it can give you gas and bloating. And so it makes you feel like you got a bad stomach ache, and it can actually give you, if you get sick enough, anaphylaxis in both of these cases, which means your throat starts closing up and you can't breathe. And there's about 
Uh, well, there are cases of anaphylaxis every year in America. There's people dying from allergy. Hmm. So what? how is this uh, diagnosed or misdiagnosed typically by doctors? Or is it properly diagnosed? What, what's I, the state of the I, I think I think the diagnosis has not been the problem. I think there's been a sea change we'll talk about a little bit later where the treatment has been a big problem. But the testing is very accurate. There's a couple of different kinds of tests. There's a blood test that's super accurate with foods. But it gives you some false negatives on the airborne allergies. So if you get a so there's an IgE blood test, you're pretty going to much know exactly what to avoid. If you get a skin scratch test, that scratch test is going just beneath the skin, sometimes on the back, but it's really more and more modern uses on the arm. It'll determine the airborne allergies and the environmental allergies much more accurately than the blood test will, but it gives a lot of false positives on the food. So the perfect companion is you get a blood test and you get a skin test and you can tell exactly what your problem is. And what we test for is what are the most common things out there. We're not testing the universe. We're just testing the uh, universe that's dealing these allergies out to folks in, in the worst way. So, okay. Um, and then what? So let's say I live in Austin or Houston and I get these two tests and, uh, you know, like in Austin, we've got cedar and ragweed and things like that. What, what do I do if I'm allergic to uh, certain seasonal allergens from, from plants? What do I do? Well, most doctors are just prescribing Flonase. The problem with antihistamines, decongestants, and even steroidals if you have asthma, which pretty much everybody has asthma, has allergies, and everybody has allergies, has asthma. But the uh, if you have these over-the-counter drugs or even prescribed drugs that are stronger, maybe. The problem is you're just sort of mowing the weeds. If you take allergy shots, which is my world, you're uprooting the weeds and eliminating the weeds. So um, most people are prescribed this ever, never-ending merry-go-round of antihistamines and decongestants. And the problem is, particularly for kids, it's a, it really plays havoc with their digestive system, night terrors. There's all kinds of side effects that aren't very good. And then eventually, mm -hmm. if you're an adult, you will wear your system down and it won't recognize the med anymore. And the med is going to be ineffective. So you go through Zyrtec, then you go through, you know, five others. And then eventually your body just says, I don't even care anymore. Throw what else you got at me and you run out of things to throw at it. So allergy shots are really the only permanent solution that really eliminates a disease as opposed to just treats a disease. So it's it's an option, but it's not for everybody because you have to go in for shots and that's not easy for everybody. So why would Flonase not work or antihistamine not work or only work temporarily and a shot work more permanently? What's the, the difference Look, in mechanism? You just go down the aisle of CVS or Walgreens and you will see a giant aisle of allergy treatment cold treatment, cold remedies. They're all the same medications in three different variations, but they're basically either tricking the immune system or they're drying up the, the Niagara Falls I was talking about, or in some cases, they're interfering with the uh, immune system's reaction. So <clears throat> there's a lot of different mechanisms. <clears throat> there are, none of them are treating the root cause of what's causing the allergy, which is this immune system not recognizing these invaders as being harmless. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, again, an antihistamine, it seems like it blocks the body's normal response to try to get rid of an invader. But well, uh, does an it, allergy it, shot work the same way, or am I wrong? Or? Well, no, so, so think the word histamine, that's the little, I talked about these little sticky bullets called cytokines. Histamines and cytokines is what your immune system is shipping, sending to the invaders to stick to them. So the white blood cells have a little signal post to say, hey, I'm going to attack this thing. So that's what a histamine is. It's basically a sticky bullet that's a marker to tell your system, go, go, go for it, go get it. An antihistamine, again, just says, wait a minute, um, don't send any more sticky bullets, we're done here. Um, what an allergy immune system, uh, allergy shots do, it's called allergy immunotherapy, AI, uh, save your readers the time by just saying AI, it's essentially retraining the immune system with very gentle step ups to recognize the invader and then ignore it. So it's immunotherapy is like all the buzz. I'm sure you've interviewed some oncology immunotherapy experts in your type of podcast. And I've heard some of them and they're terrific. And it's basically mm -hmm. teaching the body to treat itself naturally. So you're putting all natural allergens in there and your body's in an all natural way declining to uh, get excited anymore about this uh, response it has for those that have the allergies. So that you're, you're teaching the body, retrain the body. Hey, these are cool. They're not going to bother you. Right. So because of the analogy, it will never stop. So um, there's no hope that the body will be able to destroy an allergen because it just keeps coming and coming and coming. It's like an yeah. endless supply, at least for a period of time. So the only mechanism or the only way is to learn to ignore it and see it as not a threat and accept it. How big is the room that you're in right now? Uh, 10 by 10, 10 by 12. 
Okay, so in your room right now, you have invisible to your own eyes a galaxy of about three to four billion mold spores, but it's no big deal because they're dormant. They're not going to cause a problem for you. They're not, um, they're not actual fungi. They're just wanting to be finding a host. So some of them will find their way into your lungs, no big deal. They'll get it treated by your immune system. Some of them will find their way into your ventilation system. Some of them will find their way onto your food. And if it's cheese, it'll taste delicious. And if it's a steak, it'll taste delicious. But mold has a really important function, but it's everywhere just waiting to find a host. <clears throat> you also can't get rid of mold unless you have a clean room environment, which you and I are not ISO 5 labs, so we don't have clean room environments where we're calling from right now. But you don't worry about the mold because it's literally harmless unless it finds something. And it's got to find a nice, mo cool, moist, dark place. Your dust mites on your pillow this morning, about two pounds of your pillow are dust mites. It's skeletons. It's excretia. It's the, it's the leftovers of millions of little critters who eat dead skin and perform a valuable sewage service on our bodies and in our beds. And it's kind of gross, but they're microscopic. You don't care about them. They're harmless unless you're allergic to them. So everybody pretty much in America has dust mites when they wake up in the morning. So if people wake up with sniffles and sneezes that are listening to this, that's your friendly dust mite doing its job. And if you, um, on rainy seasons or what, maybe you have a leak in your house, you feel sick all the time, you've got mold that's found a home. The outside stuff that's going on, the pollens and the danders <clears throat> with pets, that's a whole nother issue. But <clears throat> allergens are everywhere. I mean, they're just everywhere. And you just can't. You can't, unless you're a bubble boy or bubble girl, live without allergens around you. Okay. So, all right. So, so a shot essentially is like a vaccination. What is it like weakened or a, a small amount of a particular allergen or allergens and your body sees them, okay. attacks them, figures out what they are. How does it work? Well, so the first shot is one part per million and it's 0.10 ml. It's a little diabetes needle. It's a tiny, tiny amount, <clears throat> almost unrecognizable amount of what you're allergic to. And we give the shots three different shots in your arms because we're throwing the kitchen sink. Most of our patients are allergic to the world. And so we're throwing the kitchen sink at them. And so we've been checked that one part per million. The next week, it'll be stepped up by two and a half. And then next week, it'll be stepped up. And it keeps getting stepped up until we dry that vial. We do that with six different vials. You're coming in for 30 different occasions, shots in three arms, three arms, the planet you're from, but two arms, three shots in two arms. And you're starting to feel better about the third, fourth, or fifth month. Some people feel better right away, but it's pretty much cyclosomatic. <clears throat> but you're starting to feel better. And then you finish the regimen, and then you go back, and you keep your most concentrated dose, which is at the end called the maintenance, going for another year or two or three to just sort of add suspenders and a belt to your Velcro. And that makes sure that your immune systems completely recognize the invaders as harmless. So, so basically, you're teaching... You're teaching the mast cells not to send the sticky bullets at the uh, invaders anymore, that the, the mast cells are going to calm down. They're not sending a red flare up anymore saying I'm in trouble and cause this allergic response. They just ignore the invader. So, okay, so how many allergy shots over what time period and what kind of uh, results will someone get if they do that? Well, that's the thing that's sort of shocking and leads to your implication, your second question, which is the testing is incredibly accurate today has always been pretty accurate. The treatment is what I have concerns about. And so did the FDA, which is going to lead to, I think, a near extinction event in the allergy field. I forget. Oh, sorry, you know, how, how many shots are needed for different allergens? What will a person notice after shot one and two and three? If there are, you know, so, what happens? So this is, yeah, so this is going to sound incredibly general, but EMTs, ear, nose, and throat doctors tend to start have only four vials, so they give a little more concentrated dose in the beginning. So they may have six shots in four vials, 24 shots, maybe. Some people believe that you can uh, do even less. Some people believe you can do even more. It's a little bit of a wild west analogy because while there's an industry accepted practice parameter, which means here's kind of the Bible and how you should operate, there's many iterations of that Bible, just like there is the English language, just like there's our Bible. We have many interpretations and many different uh, ways that people are getting shots. We have 30 shots. It's usually two to three shots per session. Um, and uh, as I said, they're going to start feeling better month two or three or four to, to so much to the effect that many stop coming in, even though they've got more to go because the gold dust is in the final vials, which is going to be towards the end of the year. So they'll come in weekly and then they'll start coming in bi-weekly and then they'll come in every three weeks and eventually monthly. And that's the regimen for several years. But uh, what will they feel? They'll feel peace of mind that they don't wake up with flu-like feelings every morning, that they're not showing up to work sick, even though they can't really concentrate, that their uh, kids can now play outdoors in sports they couldn't before. Their kids can go rumble with the dog in the backyard and go for a walk. People that are couch potatoes and afraid of going outdoors aren't afraid anymore during their flu season. Um, and 
just generally malaise goes away. You, when you can't breathe, you can't sleep at night, you can't participate in exercise. Your whole life has really got a halo effect once you get healed of this, of this disease. And so the, the beautiful thing is, um, it's literally life altering. Literally, it's the, it's allergy is a top three cause for absenteeism. It's, a uh, you know, 60 million people. There's a lot of sufferers. Everybody knows somebody with allergy and it tends to follow families, but um, it's growing. Food allergies are doubling every 10 years and allergies are growing about every 15 to 20 years and, and doubling as well. So there's a, uh, we live in a sanitary house with a sanitary car that takes us to a sanitary office. And we used to live on farms and poke around with cows and mess with, mess with the corn and play in the dirt for dinner. And allergies weren't quite so bad then, but they're just this, in this extremely sanitary life we live has really uh, blossomed the industry for allergists. But they're about to go away, I think, and largely because of this uh, problem I was talking about earlier. You know, I, I thought I lost you. Okay, well, I did not. So what, what's the big change in the dynamic of the medical industry? You've referred to this a few times. Like what, what's happening with primary care physicians? They're being bought out, but what does that mean? They're, they're being muzzled and they can't offer allergy shots? Or what, what's the big change in the industry that's happening? It's, it's sort of that, but not really. The, the first attempts at limiting allergies. So there are allergy services companies like mine that are using a PCP to provide the service. They're basically um, being shut out of states because they're they're limiting the scope of PCP's practices by asking them questions like, how much CME do you have in allergy treatment? How much CME do you have in allergy compounding? Because that's what these service companies are requiring in their models. So Ohio, where you went to school, Illinois, Florida, Oklahoma, many states are limiting the scope of practice of CPC, and you can no longer supervise allergy outside of your scope of practice. But even bigger than that, what's affecting virtually every allergist, so it's a three, kind of a three-part story, Rich. It's, the first part is that 90% of all allergy medications are compounded in an allergist room, just like yours, your 10 by 10 room. So you can imagine with 3 billion mold spores in there, it's not the cleanest environment, but again, it's harmless because the mold is dormant. So 90%, according to the industry suppliers in my world, tell me that are not using allergy clean rooms to make their allergy compounds. So there's there's an ISO 5 standard that says zero tolerance for mold, basically. Now, if 90% of allergies are compounding in the rooms like that, why are they doing it in their exam rooms? And it's because the bulk of the ice cream that's sold in their ice cream store is the medication. So the income cash cow is making the medication and then marking it up. It's all legitimate. It's all legal. It's all honorable. But the compounding cost when you make it in your office is about one twentieth of when you make it with a professional ISO 5 clean room lab. Okay. So the cash cow is about to be thrown out and here's the reason why. And I alluded okay. to it earlier. I'm not a mycologist. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not even a wannabe, but I do study things because I'm in the business world that can affect my world. And mycology, <clears throat> study of fungi, tells us that it's a pretty freaking cool science if you're from Cleveland, if you're Texas, it's where the big dogs walk is mycology. It's a cool new area of uh, really medical discovery and, and more. But mold's pur purpose is to find a host, dig these, basically extend these clear root systems and inject acid into the host, take the proteins out, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, all the things you'll see in a fertilizer bag, and store it in the bulb or the head of the fungi. So the mold or the mushrooms you buy in the grocery store, those are all nutrients that have been sucked out of something. And the mold's job is then to find a nice underground burrow. If you've ever pulled up soil, you'll see what looks like spider webs. That's called the mycelial layer. That mycelial layer then has a, a central exchange with the root system of every tree, grass, and weed on planet Earth. And the exchange is this. I'll trade you my phosphorus and my nitrogen and everything else I've collected in my bulb for what you photosynthesized in your ability with chlorophyll. So I'm going to take the sugars and carbs that you have, Mr. Forrest, and I'm going to give you minerals that you need to grow bark and canopies and trees. So every tree on the planet Earth, with very few exceptions, would look like a tulip and be about as flexible as a tulip without this exchange. So the, so the mycelial layer is absolutely critical. Uh, it performs a mineral function, but it also performs a saving function if there's a pestilence, if there's a human uh, lumbering, if there's some kind of a fungi disease, if something is coming to attack that forest. The mother, there is a mother tree they've now discovered in the last eight years. It will collect all the minerals from the baby trees and just redistribute it when the, when the pestilence passes. Same thing will happen with the babies. They'll take the mother tree if the mother tree's in trouble. It happens fast. So we know with radioactive isotopes, there's a whole communication system, you know, just like uh, if you saw the movie Avatar, it's exactly real. It's actually based on science, this giant system. Well, so if you have a, let's say you're in a 
back to allergy again. You're making your your medications in a room that has three billion mold spores in it. All it takes is okay. one mold spore to get inside a nice, cool, moist, dark place like an allergy vial. And the hosts in there, the bio, botanicals, the, the biologicals, are perfect hosts. They're, in fact, if you look at a pollen under a microscope after it's been invaded by these mycelial roots, it looks exactly like a coal mine. So it's, it's been injected, it's been you know, sucked out, and then it's left basically a, a shell. And those bottles, those vials are going to sit in a cool refrigerator at perfect temperature for mold for about up to a year, especially the most plentiful ones, the ones I call the maintenance vials. So the mold threat is the reason why the next thing is about to happen with this near extinction of it is what I believe. So about three or four years ago, the U.S. Pharmacopoeia, which I had never heard of before, and most people can't spell it, but they set the rules for what a clean, sterile environment looks like in a lab. And they said, hey, oncologists who are mixing in your own clinics and allergists who are mixing in your own clinics, that's just called mm-hmm. sterile. That's not a that's not a very simple. Tell us why we need to keep doing that, because that doesn't sound very safe or very smart for patients. And I don't know what the oncologist said, but the allergist said, uh, because nobody gets infections, no, don't worry about it. Well, that's like telling an ice cream truck guy you can't dip the bananas in chocolate anymore. But, you know, and then the ice cream truck guy says, well, I'll play a different music now. Don't worry about it. The, the allergy industry came up with a non-answer to a very real question, which is what's happening to your allergenicity of your vials if you're making them in your clinic instead of in a clean room? And what's happening to the shelf life of your vials if, it, if, the, if that's going on? And nobody studies that in our industry. And this isn't a 105-year-old industry. It's not like the baby infant. The immunotherapy has been around for just over a century. And the fact that nobody's asking the questions is kind of shocking. So <clears throat> the FDA basically slapped a rule on that said December 1 of this year, every allergist can no longer live off their cash cow, which means mixing in your clinic unless you have a very specially designated area, which requires gloving up and gowning up and goggling up, well testing your your liquids three times a day, uh, keeping detailed records, having negative air pressure, no ceiling tiles because you got to wipe them down with, with alcohol and swab everything down all the time. I don't think allergists are going to want to take that step because it's while it's not expensive, it's extremely cumbersome. And most medical assistants are not really trained for that type of detail, and there's a lot of turnover. So the other is going to now- push the compounding of allergy shots, for instance, the larger concerns that, according to yeah, there's just a few, unfortunately, ISO five claim rooms that deal with this allergen world, and so those guys charge a lot of money, which means that just economically, without going into all the details, if a guy, an allergist, if he or she's making 180,000. And they now have to start giving up that margin to make the medications that they were making for very, very low cost. They might be making 100 or 60,000. And I just, my theory is that they're going to go back to pediatrics, go back to internal medicine, go back to what brung them, and they're just going to drop the specialty because they're not going to go work to pay off student loans making 100,000 that hard. So um, I'm not going to suggest we start a GoFundMe campaign for your favorite allergist or that we, uh, you know, worried about them immigrating to Europe. It's not, that's not going to happen. They're just going to go back to what brung them, as we say in Texas. But the allergy community is about to shrink. And I was on the phone with a, one of these big suppliers yesterday, and I said, how many allergists are, like, are they screaming their way and not trying to knock their door down? And he said, no. Many of them are trying to decide, and this sounds terrible, and I'm not trying to be pejorative with all allergists, but some of them are saying, I've got to decide between greed and getting caught meaning they're going to take their chances until a few of their buddies lose their license, and then they're all going to have to go to clean room so, or just drop out. So if we have 60 million people and only 3,500 board-certified allergists that are active today, maybe 4,000, that's not enough allergists even today. Now, out of the 60 million, very few know that they have allergies as a disease. They just think they get sick a lot. But still, when you have literally no access because if 3,500 looks like that today at a conference, a full conference, you might have 2,500 a year later, maybe 1,500 a year later. I'm, I'm predicting it's going to go down too. Well, where, where is the average person who gets allergies going to get access? Well, today we'll there's tell 30, them you can get allergies. Yeah, today there's 3,500 locations. Plus, with people like me, we're expanding and allowing PCPs to treat and test there with different models that and some are working that are not affecting these uh, four states I told you about. But, um, right now, that's where people are going is they're going to service companies like mine or they're going to the actual allergist. So um, my theory is companies like mine will survive because I have I may have 10 allergists distributed over hundreds of locations the way my model works. So I don't have to have 100 allergists at 100 locations. I can get by with 10. My, my business works a lot like a radiologist. They're not seeing the patients directly, but they're writing scripts in their pajamas at night. So yeah. 
I'm just I'm just convinced that the models like and by the way, my model is completely based on what the Air Force does. There's over 150 Air Force bases, but there's not 150 allergists. So they have a few men and women who write scripts that are sent to them by remote bases that are done by a, a tech. They do this accurate test. They send them to the allergists. They write the scripts. They ship them back out to the bases. The techs give the shots out of the locations uh, in the clinics at the bases. That's my model. My model is few allergists, many locations, and I literally copied it from the Air Force. So the, the beauty of I'm set up to handle this giant change because I don't need my ice cream truck doesn't need the medications purely to survive. We've learned how to survive without that. So are you do you have facilities where you're doing the compounding itself, or you just have a network where uh, you're able to you're able to afford and contract with these large facilities that do it in clean rooms, and then you can distribute it. I wouldn't dare try it myself. That's a really tricky industry. I would always be using, as I always have been, a supplier or a third party to do that. They know what they're doing, and they're very good at it. Okay. All right. It makes sense. Hmm. Um, do you think that most people, when they have allergies or their kids have allergies, do you think they're aware that there is such a thing as allergy shots? Or, you know, why would there be stores with shelves full of Flonase and things like that if uh, it doesn't seem like people are very aware of it, a cure for persistent allergies? You know, it's, it's funny. The there's been a lot of studies on how much you're spending on the decongestants and antihistamines, and you got to throw in Kleenex and a bunch of other things that are just letting people sleep at night, sleep aids. These are, a, it's a $2,000 a year industry for the average allergy sufferer. Okay, 2000 bucks sounds like a lot of money, but it, the medications aren't cheap. And some people are sick year-round, as I said, if they have mold or, or dust mites. So it's not just when your cedar's high in Austin, it's when your pillows, you know, are getting older. It's when your mattresses are getting older. So there's nothing about allergy that goes away if you just take those. It just keeps coming back again and again. So right. uh, many really people right. just think they're sick. Have you ever seen somebody with raccoon eyes? They got really dark circles under those eyes. Those are mm-hmm. people that are suffering from allergies badly and probably don't even know it. And again, I would say 95% of our patients don't know they have allergies. They just think they get sick a lot. I got sinus problems. I got sinusitis, like infections, whatever. Right. They don't yeah. know what it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm thinking about my own, my family's experience. And yeah, like every year, certain times of year, you know, going into winter or coming spring, I mean, I tend to get So you're saying that uh, for myself and many people like me should look into getting tested for food intolerances and allergy, allergy shots may be a better way to go. Yeah, there are foods that may make you sleepy, so you'll have an intolerance. They may make you a little feel a little strange or a little odd or a little little bloated. Those are intolerances. And now, food allergy, you'll know if you have it because your lips will swell up, your throat might start closing. Um, anybody who has a food allergy, they are they can't make out with their boyfriend. They can't um, go to the school cafeteria without fear. They can't go to restaurants without fear. The beautiful thing about food allergies is there's a wonderful doctor in Dallas uh, named Rich Wasserman. And Rich Wasserman is sort of the George Washington of treatment for food allergies. So he has taught over 100 allergists around the country how to not only test, but how to treat for allergies using a lot of the same strategies we do in airborne. And he has successfully eliminated diseases in thousands of patients. And um, the beautiful thing about what he's doing is he's pretty much doing it for free. Now, the, the good news if you're one of those doctors is you have an alternate revenue source than when this goes away, when your profit, when your ice cream truck shuts down. But the bad news is that the American um, Academy has not supported it because there's a lot of anaphylactic risk, um, even though they've got it under control. And when the American Academy doesn't support it, the worst thing that can happen is you get deemed experimental. Experimental is the sort of Damocles on any way of getting reimbursed in the future because experimental means that the signas and netness of the world can cut you off not pay you because it's not the mainstream. So the industry is never going to embrace food allergies because of the scariness of it. And the experimental designation just hit about two months ago. So sadly for people with food allergies that could have gotten eliminating, eliminated that disease in a whole different way, that is now going to dry up too, unfortunately. So the industry is about to go through a sea change. I'm sad to say that uh, a lot of smart people are now going to have to give up their training and their fellowships and all that extra work and go find another job because it's allergy is really in trouble. And uh, there are large outfits. There's a, there's a coast to coast outfit that uh, Dr. Wasserman belongs to. They'll survive. The big boys will survive. They'll figure a way around it and they'll maybe build their own lab and just sell to their doctors at cost. But the, the, the average allergist is an independent or working in small groups and they're just not going to survive. ENTs have a sinuplasty. They can do all kinds of procedures that allergists can't do that are very profitable. So they may shift gears and do more of that. But, uh, yeah, your neighborhood allergist is in trouble. Yeah, well, fair enough. I mean, 
again, on this uh, on this podcast, more of the focus is with health and improving their health. And I do feel bad for the allergists, but, uh, you know, to me, the thing that sticks out more, especially being a allergy sufferer myself, is that uh, I don't know what I thought about allergies. I didn't realize it got much more effective than problems. Again, antihistamine, flow days, things like that. I appreciate you talking about both. Um, what what areas do you serve with Beacon Clinics? Uh, you know, so to give people listening, if they have problems with allergy, kids or people they know have them, what what areas do you serve and how do they get in contact with more info? You just go on the website, beaconclinics.com, and just like it sounds, and then we're in Texas. We're throughout Texas. We'll be in Florida soon. Okay. I guess you're going to go to all the high allergy areas first, right? Well, I mean, if you look at me as a business guy, this is kind of a blue sky opportunity. It's a blue ocean strategy. We set up to thinking this was going to happen in 2012 and have always used a clean room environment and published outcomes, which is just, those are two very rare things in our industry. So we've kind of been yeah. set up for this all along. And now when this happens, it kind of means all 50 states are opening up for us. So we almost can grow as fast as we want to. I mean, it's just, um, you, you have, there's a lot of opportunity as well. That's the way I'll put it. I'm not happy that allergists are about to be put out to the street in a lot of cases, but um, yeah. it, it's a pretty good opportunity for us in a very coarse sense of the word. Okay. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and pointing this out, and it's been good to have you. Thank you, Rich. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.